You're listening to Low Profile. I'm Mark Lee Morrison, and this is the sound of the English musician Richard Youngs playing guitar with his feet. Entitled Foot Guitar 35, it's just one example of the many forms that Young's music can take. On the other 99.5% of his recorded output, you can hear him singing and playing nearly every instrument you can think of, and a bunch that you probably never even heard of. Richard Youngs has recorded over 140 albums since 1990, many of them released on his own label, No Fans Records. Usually involving an element of improvisation, you could use the term experimental to describe his sound, or you could call it a whole bunch of things, but just don't call it folk music. That phrase folk music is just applied to so much, um, it's become meaningless, you know. My good friend and friend of the show, Andrew Dorsett, joined me in speaking with Mr. Young's earlier this year to get inside his head and find out about the stories behind his work. He also shares a bit of his expertise on the subject of vegan cooking. Well, you know what, if you replace that with that and do this and this, you're so much better. Low Profile is a listener-supported show. If you like what you hear and you want to help make more episodes like this one possible, that's great. You can make monthly flexible donations at patreon.com slash lowprofile. If you can't afford to donate, you can always help by spreading the word about Low Profile. Tell your people online. Tell your neighbor. Low Profile receives in-kind support from these incredible independent businesses in Olympia, Washington. You got your San Francisco Street Bakery, your Schwartz's Deli, Old School Pizzeria for a slice, Rainy Day Records for that licorice pizza, and Schurler Easy Premium Shitty American Lager from Three Magnets Brewing. And now let's hear from today's featured artist, the enigmatic Richard Youngs. How the hell are you, Richard? Oh, I'm all right, yes. Um, you know, muddling along, really. Um, vaguely hopeful. You've certainly been active with your music output. Yeah, I know, I can't help it. I mean, I've always been in a dreadful position where I've, I've got the means to, you know, I've always had a home studio at some point and I just wait till I've got an empty flat and then I just usually do something. Unless it's a ridiculous time and I disturb the neighbours because we live in a flat and, you know, there are people around mm. us and downstairs and it does mean, you know, if, if I want to be loud, I have to go somewhere else. I can only do quiet stuff at Ooh, home. Right. So every so often I splurge on a studio and uh, maybe hit a drum. Sure. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Or gain access to something like, you know, a piano or a, an amplifier. Um, though, again, that's something I can't do at the moment, of course. You know, it's uh, kind of weird times. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I was wondering if we could sort of uh, rewind a little bit musically for both of us and probably a lot of Americans who are familiar with your music. It was the Safi album that brought you to my attention. Uh-huh. I really had no idea what to expect moving beyond that. Was that the first one that you sort of uh, broke in the States? It depends what you mean by breaking. Um, the very first record I ever made a, you know, solo was Advent, which subsequently was re-released in America. Mm. And then with a friend, Simon Wickham Smith, we, we made Lake. It was a bit of a dare, he said. You know, because I said, these records are going nowhere. And he said, well, let's make a double LP then. And, nice. kind of <laughs> <laughs> and we did. Sunshine morning, look over children sing. 
so we made this double LP and again it was sitting around doing nowhere and he we both really loved forced exposure the magazine uh -huh. and he said well we should send it to them um, they might review it yeah they just might review it and they did absolutely rave reviews of both Advent and Lake and they said well you know we'll sell a few a few copies for you in America and in the end they ended up selling the entire run wow yeah and it, it went crazy fast it was like in a month sold out the entire run of both records and was that breaking america i don't know i, I think so <laughs> yeah, that counts. Yeah. yeah that counts well advent that was what 1989 1990 uh yeah. recorded 88 released 90 yeah okay and you'd been recording at home before that Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the first, actually, the first record ever released was as uh, in a band called Oming for Wox, and that was recorded at home. It was an EP called Show Me a Sane Man, and that was probably released maybe 84, 85? Mm. Uh, been about 18 or 19 at the time. I don't reckon you know exactly how many records you've made by now. I sure no, couldn't figure I, it out. No, I mean... There was a review, I, th I think Stuart Lee, the comedian, did a review which he said something like, this is his you know, 127th album. And I, he, he just plucked the figure from the air, I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, but, but I kind of thought, well, that's a good figure to start with. Um, and uh, actually, I've got, I've got coming up, coming out on um, Oren Ambarch's Black Truffle label, I've got a record called 140, but it's like in Roman numerals. Um, no, no, sorry, it's called, sorry, it's not called 140 totally tell a lie it's called 121 in roman numerals because there are 121 different chords in it uh oh. it's quite an, you know quite a high concept album 121 different chords in it but i've put it in roman numerals just like you had chicago six chicago seven oh, chicago yeah. eight you know oh, yeah. all those chicago albums right. that there are loads of so because it's probably a reasonable estimate of how many records i've made the concept album is sort of a running theme for you, as far as I can tell. And I'm a, I'm a fairly casual fan of your music. I'm only familiar mm -hmm. with maybe like 30 or 40 of your albums. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, the landfill, yeah. But I, you know, I think yeah. I kind of get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was wondering about... Do you, do you generally come up with the concept for a record before you come up with, say, writing a song? Well, the concept, you know, it's not like I'm going to, you know, tell the story of Lord of the Rings or something. It's, mm -hmm. it's more, um, oh, this is something I really want to explore. Like aesthetically, yeah? Yeah, aesthetically. You know, I, I really want to get back to basics of recording on a four track. I really want to explore you know, randomly generated sine waves. I really want to explore, you know, this new instrument I've got. Uh, uh, I really want to explore this old instrument I've got. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not really, I'm going to craft something here. It's more like, let's see what happens. I'm not sitting down to write stuff. I'm more, it's more in the heat of the moment. I'm, I'm inspired to just, just, I just want to do something, you know. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Each of your albums has a thing like a like you, you i catch, agree it you has catch a thing on yeah mm -hmm. Like. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think all my favorite records do have a thing whether it's intentional or not you know <clears throat> it could be that um yeah it's, it's just a snapshot of how a band or someone sounded at the time or it could be meticulously thought out you know the thing mm -hmm. um but it probably there is some kind of unifying element otherwise it's uh kind of incomplete i mean like like a good compilation could be the thing you know it's, it's sure. like it's well compiled and it it makes sense as a whole i think the thing would be maybe not see it as conceptual but more cohesive does it hold together and usually there's a, a similarity of approach between you know different pieces songs whatever you want to call them So you've collaborated with Simon Wickham Smith a lot, mm. as you mentioned early on. Yeah. One of my favorite pieces 
that you two did together is that piece called Shanti Deva on Pulse of the Rooster. That was actually the high concept there was songs. Uh -huh. Simon wrote three lyrics, I wrote three lyrics, and then we just kind of jammed the um, the backing. Probably Casio presets through a really sort of yucky, cheap sort of outboard reverb with yeah, yeah. horrible <laughs> digital, cheap digital kind of effects. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's disgusting. I love it though. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah, how, can you tell me just a little bit about uh, who Simon is and your relationship? Well, well S Simon Simon now lives in America. Actually, um, uh, he lectures in Tibetan and Mongolian in New Jersey. Um, but yeah, I met him at university. I overheard him having a conversation with someone about John Cage, and I uh, butted in, I guess, and say, "Oh, John Cage," and we got talking and. Um, I think, he, I think he said before, you know, we passed that day, he said, oh, there's a Stockhausen concert um, at the end of the week. Do you want to come? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's go to that. And, uh, yeah, we, we went to the Stockhausen concert at the end of the week. But I do remember at the time I, uh, I was writing a letter to my then girlfriend, now wife, and saying, oh, I met this guy, Simon Wickham Smith, um, uh, really, really interesting guy. And then I lost this letter. Um, before I posted it, and uh, so I started again a few days later, saying like, "Met this guy, Simon Wickham Smith." I don't know, he's a bit much. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I found the original letter, and I, I think I sent her both, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but um, he's lived in a lot of places, um, but now 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 he's a lecturer in America. Wow. Uh, yeah. That yeah, that totally makes sense. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's great. Yeah. Now I was wondering about this this little album I got uh, a couple days ago. Uh, oh, ah, uh, that's my D beat album. Yeah, D beat. Okay. Yeah. This album's called Barbed Wire Explosion in the Kingdom of Atlantis. Yeah. And I threw it on, and it's yeah, like hardcore punk with understated. <laughs> Singing close well, mic. Well, I, <laughs> like, yeah, right? I, I, I find it very, I find it very difficult to sing in any other way, uh -huh. which is, you know, a, a blessing and a curse. soft spot for um sort of anarcho-punk of like the discharge crass flux of pink indians um period and you know deep beat was discharge you know they I, mean, I don't know how familiar you are with this sort of subculture but um deep beat was the rhythm that uh discharge used on throughout a lot of their records um they have a particularly good record called why one i look like it's like a it's a 12 inch sort of mini album mm. and um Anyway, then there was a slew of um, 
tribute bands all beginning with dis in their name you know dishonor disobey i'm probably making these band names up um disharmony dis they were dis this dis that um and that was my attempt at a d beat record but you know i didn't i don't have drums so i had to program the drums and uh you know it was recorded in a flat so the <laughs> you had to be had to find ways around that to um bedroom not annoy the neighbors yeah yeah, bedroom. It is very much bedroom D beat. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, it was it, it was it was a straight ahead tribute to um, Discharge. Well, yeah, it's very special. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of what you say about uh, <laughs> things which are a bit. Um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a euphemism for something else. It's very special. <laughs> it's totally special. Okay, yeah. I listened to it yeah. three times in a row when I got mm, it. Because, mm. And I had, I had time, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's just as lovely as, say, your, you know, Advent or Making Paper. Uh, just a, oh, a, a uh, whole other color. Yeah, very different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, making Paper is another piano-based album. Mm, mm -hmm. So is piano your first instrument? I had piano lessons uh, for probably about four or five years up until I was 10 or 11 and we moved and it was like, shall we take the piano? By this time I was, I should, well, I should explain my, my history of piano lessons. Start with, I had this, we lived in a village outside of Cambridge and I had this student from the university used to cycle out to our village and give piano lessons and he was really encouraging and um, he used to say at the end of lessons, so what else have you been playing? Not just the stuff, you know, I'm teaching you, but you're doing anything else. Um, so it kind of like, like, almost like he wanted me to come up with stuff that he wasn't teaching. And um, there was a point where my dad went to Australia for six weeks to, to work. And when you're a child, that's quite a you know, big, big thing. And I remember I um, hit the bass notes the piano with my elbow and sort of chanted something about Australia and uh, I dared showed this piano teacher this piece you know which were elbowing the, the the bass notes the piano and he and he and my memory is that he was so encouraging about it he thought you know like, almost like that's the best thing you've ever done <laughs> you know forget wow. all the stuff I've been t teaching you anyway he had to leave and um, I went to the village there was a village piano teacher um, and it was along the lines of sorry but your your hands aren't in the correct position you need to you know go back to basics your your let's start with some scales you know it was it was all mm -hmm. oh it was like brain death yeah. um so by the time we were due to move i just wanted to give the thing up so yeah it it had to go and i've just about forgotten how to play the thing i'm very rudimentary my piano skills now mm. i ca i can't really get very far with it um I should say making paper happened because um, Chris Swanson of Jag Jaguar, having re-released um, Safi, he said, I'd really like to know what it would sound like if you did a song album at a piano. Uh, mm. And, a, and a, my friend Brian had a piano around his flat in Edinburgh, so um, just went round his and he had a mini disc recorder and it was like two really... Like, horrible microphones one in the piano inside the piano one up to my mouth and um, just recorded it to mini disc and uh, that was that I think after we'd recorded some mini discs, I maybe took it to a studio and there was a touch of reverb added on, on it just to. That sounds about right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was sort of a commissioned record. Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about? I I feel like I heard a similar story behind Beyond the Valley of Ultra Hits, is that someone challenged you to make a yeah, pop record. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I was, I was sitting around uh, with my friend Andrew Payne and we were talking about modern pop music and I think I said to him, well, it's really just beats and hooks, isn't it? That's the key. And we kind of reflected on this and he said, you should make a record with beats and hooks. I had an idea With thoughts of collapsing stars and 
That's what I, I, that was that. Um, in fact, I made it, I remember making it because uh, my son had just been born and I, I, all the recording was done during his nap times. Mm. So when he was asleep, I did a quick bit of keyboard or a vocal and then he would awake and that was the end of the session. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I've got a baby boy at home right now, so. Yeah. I, I can definitely relate. <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. So you just yeah. you've got you've got one child sorely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorely, yeah. yes. And he he wrote uh the first song on your Summer Through My Mind record, uh the lyrics, well, yeah. Yeah, well how that happened was he was off school with chicken pox and he came up with the lyrics and I do remember there was a review in the wire which doubted that he came had come up with the lyrics you know how could so, a child come up with these lyrics but that's precisely the kind of lyrics that children come how, up how with How old was he? I think he was about 6 maybe. Yeah. And I think I think at that age you you're not self-conscious enough to stop yourself. No. And no. you've and you've also haven't got maybe a total grasp on how language works properly so you and you're having a bit of fun with it, um, yeah. and you can actually write really good lyrics. Um, so he wrote the lyrics, and I, and I, I just kind of strummed the guitar, and, and I said, "Well, let's record it." And he said, "I'll play the harmonica," and I just gave him a harmonica. I'm making a mountain of doom just for fun, just for fun. Yeah, I'm making a mountain of doom Just for fun, oh, just for fun It's just show, it's just show It's just for show, it's just for show
just crazy for my mountain of doom. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm just crazy for my mountain of doom. show just a show just a show it's just for show just a show just for show Every hero has a mountain of doom Yes they do Yes they do Every hero has a mountain of doom Yes they do Yes they do It's just for show just for show just for show just for show it's just for show it's just for show show me what you are I, I mean I've, I've subsequently asked, uh, asked him um, so what uh, how do you play the harmonica like that? That's really good. And he said, oh, just keep blowing and sucking. Just don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, I can relate to that coming from... I, I have a six-year-old as well, presently, uh -huh. and uh, I could totally yeah. see her saying something like, I'm just crazy about my mountain of doom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It was very special. Um Sorry to use that word again. It's just... special. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that's maybe my place in this world to be special. Yeah. And you know what? You know what? Stuff that isn't special, what good is it? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's accomplished. It's brilliant. It's superb, but it isn't special. There's a lot of that stuff about. You know, there's a lot of very good stuff around, but it's not special. So I, I think I'll own special. Yeah, I want to be special. Well, <laughs> welcome to a very special interview with Richard Youngs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you uh, might let us in on the secret of some of your uh, other favorite writers, musicians. Well, I'll tell you what, two things have happened during lockdown. Mm -hmm. I've given up driving and I've come to love dub. Roots era dub, and mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty much all I've been listening to for several months. I kind of like the stuff which is quite. Um, sounds like they're really wrestling with the equipment. They haven't quite got what they need from it, and it's yeah. it's not quite working properly. And uh, you know that, that's that's distorting, and they've used the wrong microphone on that. And you know it's, that's the stuff I really like. Um, before it gets too slick. Mm -hmm. So like, like maybe like early King Tubby and. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes, yeah, uh -huh. um, yeah. I mean, I, that uh, she, yeah. Though having said that, the the, the Gateway record was um, a Jar Shaka record, which was probably from the eighties. It's hard to say from the sleeve. Um, commandments of Dub. And I don't know exactly what the date is, but it's certainly a lot later. And I think it's actually a, a made in London. That one was not in in Jamaica. But, but the great thing about that record is it's kind of got synthesizer on all tracks, like doing sirens or like Hawkwind-type space effects Ooh. on every single track. Wow. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really joyous, yeah. That was kind of the gateway. And then, um, I don't know, what, what happened? I just kind of, one thing led to another, and I just thought, well, I'll buy some dub records, you know. I've got the time on my hands, and, yeah. Got Team Tubby's Roots of Dub was one of them. Uh, and that's that's brilliant. That is. But I, I will say I'm not going to make a dub record. I think that'd be disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> I 
really bad. Um, I, I think I'd much rather any influence it has to be just sort of feeding into me. Maybe my my mixers would just be slightly warmer or uh -huh. there'll be more space in them or something like that, but it's not going to, yeah, it's not going to be a poor man's dub. You've been playing a lot of music using your feet in the last year or so. It's yeah, uh-huh. What possessed you to explore using your feet more? Multiple albums entitled Foot Guitar. Part, is yeah. it what, seven, eight of them? Seven, and there's a foot band, yeah, foot which band. I play a few other instruments, yeah. Right. Um, well, I'd kind of given up playing the guitar for a while, and I picked it up again and thought, how can I make this interesting for myself? And I was trying different tunings. Um, I don't know, just doing things I wouldn't normally do. And I was still not convinced by my guitar playing. It, it wasn't speaking to me. And I do remember very clearly, and it's, it's my son again, um, we were on a train, he was going to football practice. Well, I said to him on the train, how do I, how do I make my guitar playing? more interesting. Without skipping a beat, he said, play it with your feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, precisely, that's it. Yeah. How did I not think of that? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, next day I played it with my feet and um, that was that. Yeah, really got, really got into it. See, the joy of it initially is you don't have much control over what you're doing with your feet. It's, it feels so alien. But after seven albums of the stuff, you do begin to kind of get a bit of control. You know, you can damp the strings. Um, if, you're, if you're sort of... You know, do things like sellotape a drumstick to one foot and use it as a slide, you could kind of control where it went a bit more. Um, so I need to maybe unlearn it a bit before I can return. Yeah, or, I mean, we could, you know, move up, do knee guitar. <laughs> Where does that end? Right. <laughs> we don't want to go up too much higher right now. No, no exactly, <laughs> This has yeah. got to go on the radio, so. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Um, Andrew, you, you had something about uh, Richard's lyrics. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just was curious. Mm. Um, uh, you, so many of your lyrics are, have a, a very a very certain kind of poetry to them. I just was curious. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, some 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 lyrical influences you could you could talk about favorite. I don't know writers or poets or songwriters okay. or environments. Um, sure. Or, yeah. 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 I mean, I like a good lyric. Uh, to be precise, I probably write about complex existential states which you can't put into words very easily. So they're very, they're very kind of they're quite abstract and they they don't spell it out. So that's the kind of lyric I often like. I'm I'm not a big fan of lyrics that tell stories, and I also I really don't like Bob Dylan. There's too many lyrics. <laughs> um, that's what I don't like. But having said that, I love, Le I love Leonard Cohen, and he wrote a lot of lyrics. Sure. Um, and like Bob Dylan, you know, a lot of people thought he couldn't sing. Um, but I dispute that. Early John Lydon lyrics are fantastic. Mm. Um, and I'm going to totally um, go against everything I've said here uh, about not too many lyrics, but I love Mark E. Smith's lyrics. Oh, yeah. Sure. The early fall lyrics. I mean, they just stand up on in print on page as well um 
whenever you see them in print, amazing. I mean, obviously Lost is one of these people who, you know, uh, didn't stay on the boil forever. Mm. Um, I'd say Damon Krakowski writes really good lyrics. You know, Damon and Naomi? Oh, yeah. You've collaborated with Damon. Isn't that He's right? drummed for me, yes. Yeah. yeah. And and funnily enough, I've actually just written some sleeve notes for their forthcoming album. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're in touch. We're friends, yeah. I've heard you talk about a, a, a band you were in, in in Nottingham called, I think it was called A-Band or the A-Band? A-Band, yeah, yeah. Could you talk mm. a little bit about that? Well, there was a guy in Nottingham called Vince Eremel who played saxophone. Um, and he sadly, sadly died last year. Uh, he was an elusive, elusive character, re- really had a spark about him. And uh, he needed a backing band. And um, there was a gig arranged and some people, I wasn't one of them, formed a, a, a band for him. And I forgot, forget what they called themselves, but it did begin with the letter A, quite by chance. And anyway, they, they um, turned up. Vince didn't. He forgot. <laughs> so they, they performed, the backing band performed without the person they were supposed to be backing. Oh. Um, mm. And then there was another one, and exactly the same thing happened. And they called themselves something else this time. Again, quite by chance, it began with the letter A. Third time did involve me. And at that time, I'd just, in, just released Advent, and there was a local record shop in Nottingham which had filed it under A, thinking the band was called Advent. Oh, right. <laughs> and uh, so we called this uh, band Advent then. And, and then it dawned on us, we'd had three lineups, all beginning with the letter A. So from that time on, everything was going to begin with the letter A, but it's going to be a different name each time. And um, there was no constant lineup, except possibly Jim Plaisto, who drove a van so he could get the equipment to wherever we were playing. It continued in one way or another, but Jim wasn't there. And for me, it kind of never was the A band after Jim left. I think he was the sort of the sort of defining element. Um, Have you had other uh, ensembles that you played with regularly after that? Well, there's uh, the Dad Disco Supergroup, Amore. Have you heard them? No. Right, you're in for a treat then. Yeah, well, Amore, it started... Uh, me and Luke Fowler, who's a filmmaker, actually, uh, artist and filmmaker, we, we were making this um, sort of... We were making music, sort of dancey music, kind of. It had a drum beat in it. And uh, I, th- I think we sort of decided it'd be better if we had a real drummer. And we had a mutual friend in Paul Thompson who... Uh, who's, who's a drummer for Franz Ferdinand. So anyway, so we got Paul in and... We started playing and we thought we need really need a bit of sort of a bass end. And Luke had recorded Michael Francis Dusch, this uh, Norwegian bassist, um, to use, I think, as a soundtrack for one of his films. And we started using samples of Michael Francis playing double bass. And uh, yeah, so it was all right. And then me and Paul were saying to Luke, you know, that's all very well the samples, but we really need you know, someone to actually play. Yeah, it'd be far better to, you know, hear. Because Luke was kind of doing program stuff, Paul was drumming, and I was playing keyboards, and playing live instruments against all the samples was a bit weird. And so, so we said, "Well, we need we need a live bassist." And Luke said, "Well, I'll ask Michael Francis." And we didn't really think of the practicalities because Michael Francis is Norwegian, lives in Norway, mm-hmm. um, and that's uh, a bit of a commute. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so. Um, Michael came over because the Norwegian government does this thing where if you're a musician and you have a concert, they'll kind of fund you a bit to go abroad and play it. So he came across and without practising, we did a gig and it it kind of held together. And the following day, we went into a studio and recorded our first two 12 inches live in a day. Wow. Mm. And just before lockdown, uh, Michael came over with a improvising quartet he has with French horn, flute and cello, and he plays double bass, and we did like a, a seven-piece version of Amour.
yeah, uh, a more. I'm in a more. I'm in a disco band. Wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're all dads and we're all sort of middle aged and over the hill. <laughs> and, so we're like dad disco. Uh, so is that what you would point somebody to if you meet someone from your day to day who doesn't know maybe that you do music? Yeah, that'd probably be a good starting point. Yeah, it's recognisable as music to a lot of people. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, maybe, you know, maybe maybe something like I don't know, um, Safi possibly. The, the right. songs are a bit long and it's a bit I don't know, soul searching maybe for some. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Fire has been sort of the ubiquitous tune that people associate you with, and at least in yeah. some circles. Sure, sure. Yeah. But I feel like uh, that song has a bit of a successor now, at least. You seem to like performing Spend Me Endless in the Universe, m- maybe more than other songs. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't haven't done Soon It'll Be Fire for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh and, you know, I, I've got a very bad memory for words, so I write all my words down on bits of paper, use a music stand, mm-hmm. use that as my cue. And I, I kind of felt I'd been treading on water with my live show. I, you know, the, the live show is often about interacting with the audience and so making it up as I go along, but uh, you've always got this thing to fall back on. And it was beginning to worry me that I was not being experimental enough in my shows. I've always kind of tried to be experimental in the live environment where, you know, I, I go into a show not really knowing what I'm going to do. And it struck me, right, I need to get rid of this prop. So I did a performance which is of just of the songs and after each song I just destroyed the lyric and that was that, you know, actually ripped it up and just threw it away. And I'm not sure I have the lyrics to some of these songs anymore so they won't happen again. Uh, but yeah, Spin Me, Endless in the Universe was, it's definitely, it's another long, it's a big song, isn't it? It you know, is. It's, um, yeah, and I have done that live quite a few times. I think it benefits from people listening to it, I think. If you're in a room performing it and everyone is quiet and it is long and you're, you're really pushing people's attention and focus and it, it becomes a sort of edge to the room. When you, when you do something like that. If I were a superhero A superhero With a superpower My superpower It would be It would be honesty Spin me endless in the universe Spin me endless in the universe I mean, live, I've, I've done it um, unaccompanied voice as well. Uh, that's, um, and I've done it with guitar as well, yeah. Do you sing in the shower? Uh, nothing, uh, yeah, if I do sing in the shower, it might be, I don't know, there, there are a few tunes which go in my head repeatedly. You know, it might be something like, you know, Neon Lights by Kraftwerk, just oh, endlessly oh, yeah. going <laughs> around in my head. You know, that's a good one like that. for you know, the like shower. A, Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just so kind of like uh, it wouldn't be like a like I'm going to sing the song from beginning to end. It'd be just you know maybe the chorus repeated about ten times. You know. Um, we figured out that you used to do some food writing. About. I did. Yes. Yeah. I was. I was. Um, 
I was unemployed for quite a while and uh, used to go around to friends and we used to like do cooking and it was, it was kind of, you were know, both vegetarian, he, he was partly, I think he was sort of vegan and so he cooked a lot of vegan food and um, I had a lot of time on my hands, began to write the recipes down and, um, and I, was, I was thinking, well, you know, I should maybe send them to a magazine or something, you know, maybe make a bit of extra money here. Uh, they might, you know, run a column or something, you know, right, right, like, you know, just run a, an article. And I sent, one of the things I sent them to was the vegan magazine and then sent them a batch of recipes and they said, this is fantastic. Do you want, um, have you got any more? So I sent them some more and about two or three issues in a row went where they had recipes for me and then they said, do you want to become our regular cookery correspondent? So wow. I, I became the regular, regular cookery correspondent of the vegan magazine. And this went on for quite a while, and so I amassed quite a lot of recipes, and it, it struck me, I've got enough for a book here. I'll send it to a... I'll send, I'll, I'll send the idea to a publisher. And I sent it to this publisher, and uh, I said, yeah, we'll publish it, but you've got to have a section on burgers. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, vegan burgers, obviously. And I'd never made one in my life, so I did a... And, and you need one on cakes. So I'd never made any vegan cakes. So actually, they're the worst sections in the book. Oh, wow. Um, it, weirdly, actually, it, it, it had four print runs. It sold more than any of my records, uh, that cookbook did. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, so, um, yeah, and then, then, you know... I, What's the title of I that book? So Cook Vegan. Okay. You can probably pick it up really cheaply, um, and uh, there is a the fourth edition had American measures in it. If you're if you're keen on actually following some recipes, mm. but I, I you know what I I don't write recipes down, but I cook a lot better now. Um, it's very much a snapshot of the time. Um, I'm kind of quite embarrassed by some of the recipes. I think uh, you know, and I can look at some of the recipes which are halfway to being good, and thinking, well, you know what, if you replace that with that and do this and this, it'd be so much better. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I still love to cook, but I don't write the recipes down now. Okay. Well, it's funny, you must have telepathy, because I, one thing that's a regular, recurring thing on this show is I like to ask some of our more higher esteemed guests, such as yourself. Not the low ones. The, no, high... no, only the important <laughs> ones. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, right. Or, or the special. special. Yeah, yeah, the really special. The really yeah. special ones. Yeah. I like to, I like to ask uh, how you like your burger. You know, well, it couldn't have meat in it. I've gathered that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, how, how does it how's it stacked up? How's it dressed? Minimalist, maximalist. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I don't come from a burger culture. You've got to bear that in mind. I'm sure. But uh, I would I would want in my burger. I well, start with no mayonnaise. I loathe mayonnaise. Oh, me too. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I'd quite like mustard. Mm. I, um, yeah, that's the squ squirty thin American stuff. Well, we'll send you a case of that just as soon as we can. <laughs> 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 you can actually buy it here, and for, we've got some in the fridge. I oh, can tell good. You that. good. Yeah, yeah. Some pickles, you know, gherkins. Mm. Maybe some sort of crunch from salad. Um, that'd do me. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I would say vegetarian burgers. I mean, I don't think they should really necessarily taste like meat. They should possibly be their own thing. Taste like a vegetable, yeah. Yeah, I mean, or, or taste, you know. I, I don't want, I, you know, they shouldn't necessarily taste like meat. I think that's what I want to say, yeah. Yeah. Um, should, be a, should be a cheap imitation for sure. Yeah, I like, I like it when they're made from a black bean. Yeah, something like that, mm. yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, maybe spice it nicely yeah. and, yeah. Totally, I'm totally with you. Yeah, we got a little bit more, and we're we're gonna we're not gonna keep you too much longer here. Whatever, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just had one more question for you. Uh, mm. I think it was 2005. You put out a record called Beating Stars. That was a oh, yeah. collaboration mm -hmm. record, I think. Um, yeah, with Alex. I yeah. love that record. That's that's a beautiful record. Alex who? Yeah. Nielsen. Oh, that's Nielsen. right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I think it might be the first track on that record. You, uh, you, you sing this this lovely old, uh, I believe it's a British uh, folk song, "Rolling in the Dew." Yeah, like a fourteenth mm -hmm. century or something, fifteenth century uh, old folk song, um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's it's such a lovely piece. I and I uh, and I, you know, I've noticed you tend to be inspired by by other, you know, folk songs and cover some other folk pieces, mm -hmm. um, and then I read that 
you have some some distaste with the common usage of the term folk music. Well, you see, what I think I like is traditional music, not folk right. music. Um, folk music seems to be applied very loosely to anything that's acoustic and is a song. To my tastes, I'm less keen on that, and I. I I'm more into traditional music. You know, I, I like the uh, recordings of old, old people in pubs just singing, very haphazardly. You know, the songs that they learnt as children. Mm. That's really endearing. And there are some professional singers who who have been great. The Watersons are fantastic. Anne Briggs was fantastic. Mm, and mm -hmm. the certain era of Steel Eye Span, I absolutely adore. When Martin yeah, Carthy joined too. them, and they oh, yeah. they didn't have a drummer. Absolutely love that. Um, and that that you know it gets called folk music, right. but. but it, that phrase folk music is just applied to so much, um, it's become meaningless, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. And you, know, you talk about folk singer songwriters, you know, people who write new songs. I don't know if that is folk right. music, you Back know. Back to Bob Dylan again, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, just cause, well, maybe, yeah. Just because they're, they're um, you know, playing an acoustic guitar, right. uh, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily making music, music of the people. You could argue that. Um, Dance music is far more, you know, music of the people than a lot of these people are. Sure. Uh, nice. But I wouldn't want to call it folk music. Um, uh, they might in a hundred so, years. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah. That's sort of a, it's been a bit of a tough one, folk music, because mm -hmm. you know, all music's folk music, isn't right. that the case, you know? Mm -hmm. I, think so, I think someone actually said that, I forget who. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say traditional music is maybe the phrase to use. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, Oh, 
what have you got on the docket right now? What do you what do you think you're gonna do next? Next, right. Um, today I just received delivery of some LPs of a trio recording with um, Chris Cassano and David Marana, which um, was made um, at the end of a two-week tour we did a couple of years back, um, and the records arrived today. Um, so it's that. Uh, I've got a cassette release coming out on blue tapes. Um, very strange kind of music I made using cassette recordings of my voice and playing a Russian seven-string nylon acoustic guitar over uh it's very sort of repetitive and kind of quite annoying um <laughs> sounds great and i've got uh, yeah i've got uh this black truffle record coming out which is based on chords of sine waves playing differently um with some singing some drums Ooh. some sort of uh, tape echo stuff um really pleased with that one and uh and as, as regards what I'm missing around, I'm playing, I, I recently bought um, a new Spanish guitar, and I've been playing a lot of Spanish guitar, um, just sitting in, in the living room and playing mm -hmm. it. Uh, there's a thing I put up in Bandcamp where I played along to some tape loops, but yeah. I'm also just playing the, the Spanish guitar on its own. You keep them coming. Yeah, I keep getting ideas, bloody ideas, and um, having to see them through. Yeah, the only way to get rid of an idea is to get it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah get closure on uh, it, yeah. Richard Youngs, thank you so much for your time. And thank you very yeah, much. It's been a pleasure. You, yeah. yeah. I feel it's been all a bit one way. I haven't asked you enough questions. Oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. you and your family have a blessed night, okay? Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. You too. It's been yeah. very special. It's special through and through. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Bye now. Much love. Bye. I think what? You too. Bye. This has been a conversation with Richard Youngs on Low Profile with Mark Lee Morrison. That's me and my returning guest host, Andrew Dorsett. Richard's music can be found at nofansrecords.bandcamp.com. More info about this episode and all previous episodes, you got that at lowprofilepodcast.com. You want to get a hold of me? Shoot me an email. Great. Love to hear from you lowprofilemarkley at gmail.com the portrait of Richard Young's for this episode was painted and donated by Nathan Burko Gibson and you can help support the show by going to patreon.com slash lowprofile every donation goes a long way to keep this thing rolling thanks for listening and be sure to check back in a couple of weeks I'll be speaking with the multimedia artist duo Alejandra Salinas and Aaron Bergman but before we go, you gotta hear this. It's Richard Young's all-dad disco band, Amore, and their single, Higher Moment, 